Again, we are going to be continuing our study in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. But before we dive into that, did y'all notice how we changed things up today? Pretty spectacular, wasn't it? Y'all stay seated during the first song, and then we stood for the next two. I'm just saying we can work outside the box. Frozen chosen. All right, so last week, Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 is what we made our way through. And it's in those verses, we have to remember this, that that Paul is using the illustration of a child. And of course, this is the letter that's being written to the church in Galatia. And why is Paul writing this letter? Because Paul is upset with the churches in Galatia. Why is he upset with them? Well, they've allowed false teachers to make their way into the church, the false teachers being the Judaizers. And the Judaizers are teaching heresy. Because what what did Paul teach the church in Galatia? He taught them the truth. He taught them the true living gospel. That there is only one way in which man is redeemed, is atoned before God, and that's through their faith in Christ and Him alone. No works involved on man's part. And why is that? Because man cannot work their way into heaven. They are fallen creatures who need a redeemer. For it is Christ who fulfilled the law perfectly, something that man could not do. So that's what Paul taught the church. It is faith in Christ and in him alone. But here the Judaizers have made their way in, these heretics, and they're preaching that for these Gentile Christians, they must first go back underneath the ceremonial law before they are true believers. And what happens when one does that? You're tarnishing the work of Christ. And how dare any man tarnish what Christ did. But that's what the Judaizers were doing. So here Paul, writing in this letter, is going to use the illustration of a child. Now we have to remember the church in Galatia is made up of Gentile believers. Not Jews, but Gentile believers. The Greeks and the Romans. And and there was this custom that they had. The father would select a slave, choose a slave, and that slave would be in charge of of that child until a certain date in time in which God, I mean God, in which that father saw the child as being able to take care of themselves, being able to be an adult, and then the guardian and the manager would be removed from that child's life. And this is the illustration that Paul is using in this letter. And last week we talked about how he used the child As when there's going to be a certain time that that child is going to receive the father's inheritance. And even though that child has an inheritance coming, it's not there yet. Because that date has not yet come in which that child is going to be an adult and the father is going to give that child their inheritance. Now, Now what is this comparison This is what Paul was saying about the Old Testament saints, the Jewish Old Testament saints. What God gave them was the law. That was their guardian. That was their manager. Now, of course, we know that guardian nor that manager could save the Old Testament saints. But God put those laws there to what? Show them what sin truly is but to also show them what God sees, what God loves, the righteousness. That's why the laws were given, to show them their sins and to show them what God adored. And just like that child, underneath that guardian or manager, until that certain time to when that child becomes an adult and that Father gives the child an inheritance, so the same was for the Old Testament saints. God the Father had set a specific time when Christ was going to come and walk this earth, but not only walk this earth perfectly, He was going to the cross. 
to become the perfect sacrifice. And everyone whose faith was in Christ, including the Old Testament saints, their sins were imputed to Christ that very day. And there, as he's hanging on that cross, God's wrath being poured out upon him, your sin debt, O believer, being paid in full by what Christ was doing, but it doesn't stop there because the righteousness of Christ was then imputed to every single person who ever believes. Past, present, and future. That's what Paul is talking about. That's why he's using this illustration of a child. And once that day comes, that child is going to receive their inheritance. The guardian and the managers are going to be removed. That's the illustration. Old Testament saints had the law until the time of Christ. And then Christ fulfills the law perfectly. It's not that the laws went away or that the laws were abolished. They were fulfilled in Christ. And why is this so important for them to understand? Because the Galatian church had become lazy. They were no longer studying the word. They weren't digging into it. They weren't taking what the Judaizers were saying and comparing it to the word of God. So Paul's going to have to break bad on them. He's calling them out. And he's saying, how can y'all go back underneath the law that Christ fulfilled? Do you not see see what you're doing? You're taking away what he did on the cross and how dare you? Paul was angry. And he continues in the writing last week, still using the child. And he says in verse 3, in the same way we also... Notice he's including himself in on this. When we were children, we're enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Well, what's he talking about here? This we is meaning before they believed, before their faith was in Christ. So this we is talking about when they were non-believers. For the Gentiles, do you know what they are enslaved to? The cults, the pagan traditions. And for the Jewish people, including the Judaizers, even though there's I'm not sure they were true believers, just saying. But even for the Judaizers who were underneath the ceremonial laws before they came to the faith, do you know what the Jews did? They took the scripture and they twisted it. This being the Old Testament saints as well. And by twisting the word of God, they made it a works-based salvation. That wasn't God's intention. God's intention was for them to have the law, to show them what a sin was, but also to show them what was pleasing to God. But they took that and they twisted it and they manipulated it. So even the Jews were enslaved to the law. The principles of the world, that's what this is speaking of. And, and, And think about it. I mean, really think about what's being said here. Christ fulfilled the laws, but but that's not good enough to you Judaizers. You, You still think that you have to do something for your salvation, and this is what you're teaching within the church? Paul is saying, how dare you? It's something, isn't it? There's times even in our lives as believers to where we become lazy when it comes to the word of God. There's times in our lives where we forsake spending time in the word teaching our family. And the book of Galatians, that's a warning to all of us what can happen. If we become lazy, if we don't take what's being taught, what we're listening to, and compare it to what the truth is. So here, Paul continuing and speaking in in verse 3 where I said, when we were children, again, them talking about Paul speaking of how they were unbelievers at that time. 
And yes, they were enslaved to elementary principles of the world. The Gentiles enslaved to their cults and their false religions. And the Jews enslaved to the laws. Paul continues in verse 4 and 5, which we looked at last week. I'm going to read it together. Paul says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. When Christ came, again, lived that perfect life, went to the cross, the ultimate sacrifice, died, was buried, resurrected, and descended. The law was fulfilled. There is no reason whatsoever to be put back under the law. As a matter of fact, in the, in the understanding of what Christ did, you are now a child of God. You have been adopted. Do you understand the importance of that? That's what he's saying to the church in Galatia. You've already been adopted. There's nothing else you can do. It's done because Christ did it all. But for the Galatians, here they are. They've been hoodwinked. They're, they're sitting here thinking, no, 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 well, what Christ did wasn't enough. So, so maybe we do have to go back underneath the ceremonial laws like the Judaizers are telling us. Church, we have to understand, and this is what Paul is saying to the church in Galatia, that it was Christ who redeemed you by fulfilling the law. The law was never going to redeem you. And, he, and he's trying to get this point across to them. And, and I pray today that this point is coming across to you in here, because so often, do you know what we do as Christians we don't think that it truly is just faith alone. I mean, as, understand, as an understander of Reformed theology, we do claim that it is faith in Christ and Him alone. But do we truly grasp that? Or, or do we sit and tell ourselves that we're not doing enough? That there's more that can be done? Because I'm worried on that day when I stand before God, I'm not going to, I haven't done enough to please Him. Listen, if, if you feel that way, hear me when I say this. You will never do enough to please the Holy of Holies. But your faith is in the one who did. And, and that's it. That's what Paul is fighting here. Now look at verse 6. This is, this is so important. Paul continuing with this understanding of adoption. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, so now Paul has moved on from the we understanding, the point to where you are a non-believer, and now he's telling them how that transition takes place. We're seeing this adoption process play out. And how does one become a believer? Does it say anything about doing so many works or holding to the ceremonial laws or, or committing so many sacrifices or going out and feeding the homeless? Does it say any of those things about your faith in Christ? Does it say anything about those things when it comes to your salvation? No! Well, we're seeing how this plays out, and it's God sending the Holy Spirit upon His adopted children. This is the work of God working in you. He's doing the work because you can't. He's rescuing His adopted children by sending the Holy Spirit to dwell within them. And it's during this process of the Holy Spirit coming upon that adopted child that they hear the truth and they believe it. But not only do they hear the truth and believe it, they now want to believe it. 
were as before they couldn't. Why? Because they were not a child of God. L- let me land on that point just for a second. Please understand this. That not every single person born into this world is a child of God. God's children are only his children by way of him adopting them, by way of him regenerating them, by way of him sending the Holy Spirit into them, regenerating their heart. That is a true child of God. But we've been forced, or we have been taught, forced, that's kind of a strong word, isn't it? People holding a gun to your head. Now, you're going to believe this. No. What we have been taught is that everyone is a child of God, but that's not biblical. Only those who have been adopted by God the Father are His children. And this is where some people, it kind of trips them up a little bit. Well, how do I know if I've been adopted? I haven't received the papers. Well, what does this mean? Church, it's really quite simple. Is your faith in Christ and Him alone? That's, we want to make this so difficult. But Christ did the difficult part. Rest in what he did. For if you believe you are a child of God, and this relationship with God the Father, the one who adopted you, understand that it is personal. That's the reason that the word Abba is used here. And it's the Aramaic word for father. But, but the more intimate understanding of the word father is like men. Notice I said men. When your child comes to you and they call you daddy or pops, that, that's that type of intimate relationship. That's the word father. That's what it means in Aramaic. It is so personal. This is the relationship you have with God the Father, the one who spoke the world into existence, the one who created every single thing, and he has adopted you. And this is why it's so important to understand that intimate relationship that you have with God the Father and how the Holy Spirit works within you. Because even though we have been adopted by the Father, and even though the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we are still in our flesh, which means what? We are still going to sin. You're still going to rebel against God. But but do you know what happens now? You're convicted. It hurts when you sin. It should bother you that 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 weight just comes upon you and you sit there and you question yourself it's like why did I do this and I know that this isn't pleasing to God and yet here I am but you know what happens oh true believer with the Holy Spirit dwelling within you do you know what his work is the Holy Spirit is going to convict you of what you've done And this is what's so amazing about having that relationship, that intimate relationship with God the Father, is that you're going to cry out to him, Abba, Father, please forgive me. And it's absolutely amazing the grace and mercy that God has upon his children because you have already been forgiven. And as a child of God, his wrath is no longer towards you and why because the son took the wrath that you deserve upon himself this is the relationship we have with the almighty trinity and this is one of the reasons why Paul is upset with the believers in Galatia but because they're allowing this heresy to come in and take away from the truth in what God has done for you, oh wicked sinner. That's what Paul is writing. Now look at verse 7. Paul continuing, he says, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. 
And if a son, then an heir through God. Keeping all this in context, I, I sound like a broken record, I know, but the Judaizers are wanting to enslave the Christian church in Galatia back underneath the ceremonial laws. But Paul is telling the believers in Galatia that, listen, because you are now a child of God, you're, you're no longer enslaved to the law. Because you are now a child, because you are now a believer, you are now a son of God. You've been adopted. And since you have been adopted by God the Father, then you are now an heir of the Father and fellow heirs with Christ the Son. That's how all of this is playing out. And what does that mean? Well, what is Paul meaning by stating this? As a believer for the church in Galatia and for every single believer who's lived since then, before then, and will live up until the time Christ returns, it means that not only is the believer an heir to God the Father, but they are fellow heirs with Christ the Son. That means that every single believer has the same possession as Christ the Son. Do you understand that? If you are a believer in Christ, then you have the same possession as Christ the Son. So no longer is the believer under the bondage of the law. Because you have been given the righteousness of Christ. No longer will the believer stand before God in their sin-stained clothes. No longer will the believer stand before God in that wretched flesh that reeks of sinful, wicked acts against God. No, now the believer has been cleansed by the blood of Christ. And as fellow heirs, you too are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Paul is saying to the church in Galatia, what else do you need? It's a rhetorical question because nothing. For every single believer that stands before God on that day of judgment... You will be seen as Christ is seen. That being perfect and blameless. But remember this. The same way in which Paul is teaching the church in Galatia. Remember this though. It's not because of anything that you have done. And yet, here the church in Galatia is receiving the teaching of the Judaizers that they need to go back underneath the ceremonial laws. Paul's not going to stand for this. And in church, neither should we. That's why Paul is writing. That's why Paul is upset. He's saying, how dare you, O Judaizers, teach that man has anything to do with their salvation? How dare that be taught? Paul was angry because what he taught, while inspired by the Holy Spirit, is that it is faith in Christ and in Him alone. And yet here the Judaizers are taking the truth and they're destroying it. And here you have the churches in Galatia taking that broken truth, that heresy, and receiving it. 
And this is concerning to Paul. Look at verse 8. It says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. Again, Paul speaking to the church in Galatia, where he's telling the Gentiles, look, there was a time when you didn't know God. There was a time when you were enslaved to a false religion, spitting in God's face by being in that false religion, by believing that false religion. And do you know what that false religion taught? That you had to complete so many works. Whatever God you're trying to appease, you had to complete so many works before that false God would even receive you. These false religions that these Gentiles were were mixed up in were based on wicked works taking place in a wicked satanic temple. These Gentiles, they would be cutting themselves in a form of worship. There would be numerous deviant sexual acts that they would take place in as a form of worship. And for some, yes, even sacrificing humans would also be a form of worship. They had enslaved themselves to these false gods working their way to return the approval of a God that didn't exist, the very false ones that they worshipped. And we, we hear about this today. And we say, but that was a lot more, eh, that was a simpler time. Those folks back then, they weren't that intelligent. They, they were dumb compared to us today. Have you guys heard of Scientology? You look at the false religion of Scientology today. It's a works-based religion. It's a money-based religion, sadly like so many evangelical churches today. But inside Scientology, you have to go through something called an auditing process. You have to pay money for these auditing sessions. And the further you advance in the auditing process, the more you heal yourself from some type of traumatic event that left scars that are still active on your mind. But you can free your reactive mind by being audited, where you hold these two sticks in your hands and answer questions. And somehow this is freeing to your soul. But also remember that every time you're audited, you spend a little bit more money. Those who take place in this works-based religion are following a man by the name of L. Ron Hubbard, the man who created it, the man who is now dead, the man who did not rise from the dead, the man who is in eternal darkness right now because he denied Christ and him alone. And it's at this point in time in L. Ron Hubbard's eternal life, he knows that Scientology does not redeem man. And sadly, that will be the outcome for all those who follow in L. Ron Hubbard's teachings. They will find out the same thing that L. Ron Hubbard knows now. That without Christ, without faith in Christ and Him alone, you will answer for every one of your single sins against God for eternity. But once again, we are seeing the truth that man cannot work their way into God's good graces. It is a gift that has been given to you. Which is why we serve a merciful God who has rescued us when we did absolutely nothing to be rescued. 
Look at verse 9. Paul writes, but now that you have come to know God, if you mark in your Bible, I would suggest highlighting the very next part, or rather to be known by God. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? The truth that Paul is laying out for the church in Galatia is that for those whose faith is in Christ, you have been set free. And and Paul really digs in here. Because if you notice where I said highlight, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, That's what God did. That's what God did by way of sending His only begotten Son. That's what God did by way of sending the Holy Spirit upon you so that you would believe in what Christ did. Because you have done absolutely nothing to be known by God. Matter of fact, you go to Romans 3 and it says, No one is even seeking Him. No, not one. But it's God who knows you. It's God who's rescued you. And now, here the Judaizers are teaching, this isn't enough. Let's go back underneath the law that you have been freed from. See, so we have to understand that the ceremonial laws, they serve their purpose in the Old Testament to the Old Testament saints. And what did the, what did the ceremonial laws do? It pointed the Old Testament saints to Christ. It was a foreshadowing of what Christ was going to fulfill. It's done. It's complete. So what's taking place now? What's taking place now in what these Judaizers are trying to do? They're turning God's holy laws that Christ has fulfilled, they're turning them into a man-based work. And in doing so, you're serving a completely different God. You understand how important this is. Because God wasn't commanding the Christians to go back underneath the ceremonial laws that his son completed. I said this last week, this is what's so concerning about the Jewish faith today, is it's not the true Jewish faith, because the true Jewish faith has transformed into Christianity the moment that Christ stepped foot on this earth. The, the Jewish faith today isn't God's Jewish faith. That time is done. That time has been completed. That time has been transformed into Christianity. That's what Christ did. Now look at verse 10. Paul says to them, you observe days and months and seasons and years. Paul Paul is saying is, now for you Galatian You you Christians in the Galatian churches, you're returning back to the feast? You're going back to the festivals? You're going back to the new moon and the Sabbath day? What are you doing? You're saying that man is responsible for telling you the foods you can and can't eat? You're saying that man, you are now enslaving yourself back to man's laws on the drinks that you may or may not consume? This isn't from God. Again, I say this is what's so sad about the Jewish faith today. The very ceremonies that they still hold to, it's not pleasing to God anymore. Because what you're saying is what Christ did isn't enough. 
I need to continue doing it. Practicing the Jewish faith today isn't godly. It's not pleasing to God. Because you're denying what Christ did. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I I promise, it's the most loving thing I think anyone can say if you're warning someone that the so-called faith that they're in is damning them. For the denomination, the Church of Christ, one of the things that they hold to, and it's not every Church of Christ, there's different sects within the denomination that still believe that you're not a true believer until you are baptized, that that's when you are regenerated. But that's not the case, church. It's not taught in the scripture. So, So we're seeing how man has still twisted the word of God even today by trying to pull people, so-called believers, back into this work-based salvation, trying to pull them back underneath the ceremonial laws. Again, I'm not saying every church of Christ believes that, but that is still taught in many of the churches of Christ today. And then we come to this part, in this verse, where it's really quite staggering. Paul is telling the churches in Galatia, the very ones that he planted over 17 years before this letter went out. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Could you imagine a pastor, a teacher, an elder, the Apostle Paul standing before you? Of course, I know he's writing this in the letter, but it's going to have the same punch. Standing before the churches that he planted, saying that I may have done all of this in vain. Because you're not listening. What's Paul doing? Is he creating a new religion? No. He's preaching the word of God. He's preaching the truth. And yet here they are saying that's not good enough. We want more. We want something else. So here's their original pastor saying, I may have done all this in vain. You tell me that's not a wake-up call? Would that not be a slap to the face? I would surely hope so. Paul's telling the church in Galatia, how can you do this? How can you be so immature after all these years? How are you still sipping on milk? How are you guys still babies? Why am I still having to hold your hand? Paul's telling them to grow up. Quit playing church. Dig into the word. What the church in Galatia should have done as soon as those Judaizers stepped in, The elders should have stepped up and said, one of two things are going to happen here. Either you're going to repent and quit teaching this heresy, or we're going to physically throw you out of this church and you're not coming back. That's what a mature church should have done. But here we have Paul saying, I've done all of this in vain because y'all are still toddlers. Also, this coming from Paul, the man who's been imprisoned, the man who's been stoned numerous times with rocks, 
The man who was beaten so severely that the ones who were beating him left him alone because they thought he was dead. You have this guy telling you that maybe I've done this in vain. Maybe by way of me planting this church, I've done it all in vain. Some may read this today and think that that wasn't right of Paul. That, that was a bit harsh. Paul, writing this letter, was indwelt with the Holy Spirit. It was a divine writing, which meant what he did was absolutely correct. He was calling this church out for being lazy, for being irresponsible with the word of God, for letting their guard down and letting these wolves come in to feed off the flock. Paul is telling the church, how dare y'all, how dare y'all allow these false teachers to come in and tarnish the holy word of God. How dare y'all let these false teachers come in and tarnish the work of Christ. This is probably something that needs to happen more in the Western church today. We need to have more men behind the pulpit like Paul instead of entertainers. We need to have more elders that are willing to stand behind the truth of God and tell people how it is instead of wearing kid gloves with them because they're afraid their money's going to walk out the door. Let us pray.